more than four decades have passed since Mark Kanishi showed that songbirds use auditory feedback to learn and, in some cases, maintain their songs. This is the first study to identify a central auditory feedback representation that is harnessed for learned vocal control. And in so doing, we not only have been able to constrain the central feedback representation to a certain pathway within the brain, among several, we've also been able to identify how this auditory representation functionally interacts with the song motor network. One of the most uh, compelling examples of feedback-dependent performance is speech learning in humans, and a really beautiful uh, parallel can be found in song learning in birds. A major question that we were interested in was how the brain uh, encodes and harnesses auditory feedback to shape vocal performance in juvenile birds that are learning to sing. There are really two challenges to solving this problem. One is to identify neurons somewhere in the brain that encode information about auditory feedback. That is, they're active while the bird is singing, and they respond acutely to changes in auditory feedback signals. And the second and higher bar to clear is detecting whether or not the activity of these neurons that is generated during singing is harnessed to shape learned vocal control. There are really two stages to the experimental design. In the first stage, uh, Hui Meng and I used chronic microelectrode recording methods to detect feedback sensitive neurons in the singing bird. And then in the second stage, we used those implanted electrodes to microstimulate in the auditory system as the bird was singing. We could rely on the really high precision of the performance to uh, trigger uh, stimulus delivery to a target region in the song. So there was a trigger syllable and then a target syllable. And when stimulation was applied in the central auditory representation in the singing bird, the target, but not the trigger syllable, slowly degraded. That is, the acoustical features of the song distorted over time. And so there were three really interesting qualities to that process. First of all, it was delayed, although in juvenile birds at the height of motor learning, the onset could be very rapid within an hour or so of the onset of stimulation. It didn't occur immediately, so it's not like the auditory and vocal motor systems are directly coupled during this learning process. Even though it was delayed, the second really amazing feature was that it was temporally precise. So somehow the brain has learned to assign the error or the perceived error that was induced by microstimulation to the correct part of the bird's song. And the third is, is that the effects were really strongly age dependent. So uh, in young birds, these effects could emerge within an hour. In older birds, it could take weeks. And because we're injecting noise directly into the brain, this, and in fact, in the auditory feedback representation, what this tells us is that the cytoplasticity must be at a higher level of the brain, directly within the motor network itself. Older birds respond to central stimulation much more slowly than younger birds. Not only localizes where in the brain uh, this capacity to respond is likely to be encoded, it also, uh, in the future, can allow us to explore how the brain changes over development to limit the capacity for learning. This is directly relevant to understanding how the human brain can harness patterned electrical stimulation achieved through neural prostheses such as cochlear implants or central auditory implants to shape vocal learning and to re recover or recoup uh, vocal abilities uh, with late onset hearing loss.